audio is going to. All right, to. so you should be able to minimize that, and you'll be all set. Okay. So I'll get started as we wait for more people to get here. Basically, what we're doing is this is our second uh, tech talk. We want to take an opportunity to look at different uh, ways we can authentically, effectively use technology uh, with our students in our daily lives, different ways to utilize these tools. Um, and truth be told that this expertise needs to come from our students. So from here on out, I'm going to try and say as little as possible. And that's usually a tough thing to do. Um, <laughs> but what we'll do is the general outline is for the first 10, 15 minutes, Meredith and Kayla will share with us how to use wikis, how to use wiki spaces, different ways that they propose that it would be used, and then the remaining 30, 45 minutes, we'll just talk about technology, wikis, the impact of any of this, and it's pretty much an open discussion. So thank you for coming. Hi, I'm Meredith. Kayla. Um, I actually did this, I created a wiki space for one of the projects I did in my um, lit class last semester with uh, Grace Polivka. And I thought it was, I'd never really used wiki spaces before, but once I got like into it, it was so much fun to create it and do it yourself and, and do the whole thing. And so basically I just want to start out with what is a wiki space. And I looked it up today, the actual definition. And it's a hosting service for websites where users can edit, um, add, modify, delete uh, any kind of content that's on there. And it's basically a simplified web page, so there's no hard coding that goes into it. So it's super user friendly. And I think that's the most important part about it. So I created a wiki space uh, for my class about a geography class. And... Um, It was interesting to see all the different uh, ways that it could be used. So I think it has a lot of uses, Wikispaces, right? Um, I listed a couple uses that I thought were pretty important. I think it's, it would be awesome as a class website. Um, there's so many things you can put on there. It's so easy to connect with people online. Uh, and it's also really good for parent communication. I know they have the power school set up now where the parents can go in for the parent portal and see grades and I'm sure all sorts of grading systems have that but just for basic homework information that parents can get out when the kid comes home and says oh I don't have any homework and the parent says no I know you do they can check on the website and see exactly the assignments that are posted and it's also really cool for project based learning uh, there's a way to set it up so that the kids can actually get on and edit only a portion of the website and create their own mini website with a ton of different pages. They can embed video and pictures and put text on there. And it can kind of be like a portfolio or a semester long project so that they can, it's something that they can start and you can see their progress. And then at the end of the semester, maybe you do a presentation about it because it's a lot of hard work that goes into it. So when you log into Wikispaces, this is the site that you see. And this is your dashboard. This is where you can control everything from. I only have one page set up right now, so it's just the MK Geography. But if you had multiple pages, say you had you taught three different classes, you could have three different websites and they would all show up right here in a row. So you can manage everything from one site, which makes it really user friendly. So then you click onto the website that you want and it brings you to the home page. So this would be the home page that I chose. Um, there's a ton of different designs that you can pick from. So everyone has a different look on the, the top and the sides. And you can edit it however you like. There's an edit key right here. And it gives you a ton of options as to adding pictures and videos and other kinds of um, what they call widgets. So some of the stuff that you would do is, for example, I put a class calendar on there. It's embedded in there, so it switches. It actually switches as the month goes on, and it'll give you, what, if I get to this week's, it'll give you the weather report for the week that you're in. You can put your assignments on this, and it will continuously reload so the students can see when things are due in a real-time calendar. Instead of having it listed 5-3, you know, Wikispace presentation, it'll come up on here, so it's also a visual thing for them. Um, let's see, what else do I have on this one? Um, so then there, I'd made like a little assignments tab where anything would be posted. Uh, parents corner, so like I said, for parent communication. And you can embed 
actual document. So if you do a document in Microsoft Word, instead of copying and pasting when it might not show up exactly the way you want it, you can embed the entire document in here. So if you see right here, this is just the entire document embedded within the page. So, so you can scroll and see the entire thing at once instead of just seeing one page at a time. No excuses for losing a worksheet. Yeah. You can go print it. So. And it makes it, like Kayla was saying before when she walked in, completely paperless. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a filing cabinet anymore. All of your assignments can be posted on here, the actual handouts. And then the kids can be in charge of either doing it online and having it sent to you because you can get emails through this website or printing it out and doing it on their own time and bringing it into you. Yeah, or just so. a matter of re reprinting stuff every year. You go, oh, I just have to print that worksheet, and you go right onto your wiki, and then because this you don't will have stay to filed anything. This will stay uh, if you don't do anything to it. It'll stay on that home page when you sign in forever. Mm -hmm. It'll never go away, and you don't have to worry about archiving it or anything like that. Um, but the way that I, in my class, proposed to use this was as a project page for students. So this is mostly about student learning. So you can go into the projects tab, and I just created, you know, a geography project where every student would have a country. And you click on the page, and now this is what the students would edit. So they have their own entire page. This is for Team Brazil. Anything that Team Brazil wants to do and add, if they want to add pictures of the soccer team and videos, they can add it on here. And then there's, uh, it's not on this one actually. Uh, they can go back and forth through the different pages. They can embed like a home key. This one has the home key and go back. And what they would actually see as a student, whereas I could edit that entire, anything on that page, I could edit even the student portion I could edit they can only edit their project. So, so this, this is what the students see too. This is their dashboard. So say they were in you know, five different classes in, in a high school and five of their teachers had these. Anyone that they were a part of would also be right here on their favorite wikis. So you can set it up. Students don't need to have an email address to get a username or password. There's ways to get around that. And you, the teacher, can assign it to them so you know that they have it. And what they would do is once they get their username, they email you to request admission into the group and you just let them in. By having a username, you can see when they edit, what they edit. So you can keep tabs on, you know, if you're doing a group presentation, the biggest thing is responsibility. Mm -hmm. Who's doing what? Well, you know, if Johnny is not doing his part, you're going to see that he's never editing anything, but, you know, Sally is editing everything. So it's really easy for that where, she you knows she might come up and say, oh, well, he's not doing anything. You don't really know. This actually archives who does what. So they can get on here and just, for example, say they want to put a picture in, uh, put a sports picture in. You'd go up here to the edit bar, click edit. And then it's going to give you a ton of options up on this, uh, this little toolbar. And the one that's the picture is the file. So if you click on that, you do an external image. So just from, so say they wanted to put this picture on here, a picture of sand dunes from Brazil. You would copy the URL and paste the URL in here. You load the picture, and it comes right up. It also gives you the option to add a caption so you know what you're looking at. So you can just say sand dunes, Brazil, and then it saves it. I mean, it doesn't get much easier than that, just going back and forth. Um, I mean, there's so many different things you can do. I don't know everything about Wikispaces, but they have options for different widgets, they call them, which are just basically different things you can embed into your pages. You can do videos. How much instruction that you just gave us do your learners already come with? I mean, if you're in a high school, 
I'm assuming. That's where you were, yeah. yeah. I'm in high school. I, I mean, they come in with a good amount of, I mean, they d might not necessarily know how to use this, but if they know how to use a computer and they know, you know, copy, paste, it, as long as once they get into this, once you get them a username, they'll take right off. I don't see that being a huge thing. Are you doing this right now? What do you mean? In a classroom? In a classroom. I'm not doing it in a classroom I at my know. school, but we have teachers that are doing it. Kayla has a teacher. I have an example of a teacher yeah. that has one. Yeah. But I mean, I think that kids nowadays, not to sound all old and cliche, but they have grown up with so much technology that this is going to be an easy thing for them well, to that's learn. Our, that's kind of you don't our think research. research. Yeah, no. that's sort of our no, research. No, I just I think that's a dangerous assumption. Yeah. There's already right. a break in to the people who are 30 and above not knowing things. I have children who are 21, 23, and 25. And the difference between what the 21-year-old knows and what the 25-year-old knows is a light year. Is it? And, and I think it's really like dangerous to, to assume that yeah, that was, I made a list of downsides that I could think of, and I would say that one of the biggest ones was getting everybody set up and learning how to use it. It would take a, I mean, if this is something that you're invested in, and you're going to say, this is going to be my class portfolio, instead of doing, you know, a big journal, we're going to do it online, I'm going to see exactly what they do, be able to monitor what they're doing, it's going to take you. You know, you're going to have to give up a couple class periods because you're going to have to get them signed up. You're going to have to get them instructed on how to do what and when to do it. And then the other big downside that I see just because of where I'm placed is the availability of computers to students. Exactly. Even so, at home, they probably not, you can't assume that everyone has a computer. Exactly. exactly. So I think that's important. But I think that if you're willing, yeah, I think that if you're willing to, this is something that you want to try and, and you want to get the kids... I think it's a vehicle, like I said, it's a vehicle to teach them how to, to use the computer and the internet appropriately, to, to start something and have something good to their name on the internet rather than just the pictures they're posting to Facebook and the stuff that they're writing on Twitter, which we all know is not that great. Actually, I, see, I disagree with that too. I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being in the class with me. Um, I, think that there's, I think there's a lot of, of interesting things. I mean, I used to think when I first learned about Twitter, oh my God, I don't care who's wallpapering their stuff. But then you see the stuff that's going on in Europe when the only, or in the Middle East, when the only vehicle they yeah. had was mm -hmm. to tweet. Mm -hmm. I completely changed, I was wrong. I completely yeah. changed my mind. So I don't assume that every kid is doing crap on Facebook and Twitter. We have... We have a teacher who actually uses Twitter. He has it integrated with Facebook, so he can post on one, and it'll post to both places. It'll post to both Twitter and Facebook. And that's a really great example, but we also just had a huge issue in our school where these girls, they had prom wars, and they were mm -hmm. fighting over stuff, and it was all posted on Twitter for everybody to see. And people from, like, three who graduated three years ago were commenting on this stuff that was going well, on in That's a perfect school. teachable moment. To so... Say. Exactly. Really and by another framework and why that's not a yeah. good idea. But. So that's how they use it. But I think that this is another you know, way that they can use it and learn to use it appropriately. And if you teach them, especially as freshman teachers, if you can get them into this and commit a little bit of your time to it, it's something that I think will be very useful to them throughout the rest of their high school and if they go to college career. You have someone, right? Yeah, well, I would like to get back to the... Um, academic side of it a little more and the benefits of, the, of using it in the classroom. I was talking to one of the history teachers at school and he has two AP classes and at the beginning of this year he actually got a grant for his students to all have an iPad. So he uses the Wikispace a lot and he uses it more to provide them with information. I kept referring to it almost like a, a personalized encyclopedia or his own textbook. And then he actually just did a video about it for a presentation that he's doing. And he, uh, they interviewed all the students. And one of the kids said that you go to other classes and they say, all right, take out your book, turn to this page, we're going to take notes or whatever. But you walk into his, Mr. Kenyon's class and he says, all right, get out your iPad and open up the wiki space and we're going to watch a video. Or you're going to read this article and then we're going to you're going into groups and then we're going to discuss. So he uses a lot of visuals in his teaching, which you'll see on his homepage. And like right now, they're talking about the 60s and Vietnam War and civil rights and everything. So it's just, this is just the homepage. And he changes it with whatever unit they're doing. So he's got a ton of stuff. 
I thought maybe. And yet this is his photo, I know. So he used a lot of his own photography and videos. And on the side, he, oops, I'm back. He is um, pretty much, this is the first year that he's done it, and he's pretty much documenting everything that they're doing for the AP class. So the kids, they don't need books. I mean, they read, they have a textbook that they use, but this is just so much more interactive, and he has everything up here, and it's kind of amazing. And he said the one downfall is that he has all these iPads for the kids and everything, and he loves the wiki space, but on the iPad, the kids can't create a page. So it's somewhat limiting, but, I mean, still, this is... They can just click right here and say, oh, I need some information on the Declaration of Independence. And it's right there. Because there's so much stuff on the Internet that's good stuff. You want to guide them towards that. Because, I mean, a lot of kids, I think, struggle with the actual searching for the right kind of information. Like, well, I found that on Wikipedia. But this kind of helps them figure out what is more legitimate, too. And also to have, like, an entire year's worth of stuff archived in one place. Mm -hmm. So easily accessible. For both him yep. when he has to go back and reteach the class next year, and for students to be able to get at it. Yeah. And his is totally private. So, like, I wanted to uh, be able to show you guys today, and I couldn't even find it. But he, And I had to request to be a member. And so if anyone was on the Internet and wanted information on the American Revolution, this page would never show up. Just for the people that are invited into the group. Mm -hmm. So when you're a student with him for whatever year, you're allowed in, they'll mm -hmm. add you, and then at the end of the year, are you removed? Good question. This is the first year he's done it, so I don't think he's gotten to that point yet. I'm sure there are some kids that would like to have access, and some kids who really wouldn't care, but... Do you know if he's had to go through permissions to get all the things that he's got posted on there, particularly, those that, are they all public access documents? I think everything is, you could go find it online. It's all public. And a lot of them, like that. when she clicked, they might be linked to a web page, so it might not be the actual document, but rather a link yeah. to take you to the proper web page to read the entire thing. Yeah, if it's a link to another web page, you're all set. If you have an embed code for the videos, you're all set. Mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how much you're going to be cynical? How much extra time you want to devote to doing it? As you think of your future careers as teachers and blending the life with the job, do you say to yourself, oh, yes, I can do that. I see myself as doing that. I know. When I created or, mine. Oh, my God. He's nuts. Yeah. No, when I created mine, it took me a couple hours to play around with it and to get it set up the way I wanted. But once you have it set up, it's so easy to just add a new page and put new information on. Once you have the bones of it set... It's just adding a page for the 60s and posting your links to that. It's, it's not hard once you have the main part of it. But getting that main part set up, it, it took a couple hours for me, at least. I didn't know what I was doing. You'd also need to find the resources for exactly. the 60s. Mm -hmm. So let me cycle back to the, to the question. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm thinking about that. Is, you, know, you want to spend the next 30 years of your lives, you're probably not going to do this 24-7. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I know that this is, a, again, the first year that he's done it, and he said he's put a lot of time into it. But I know that he loves history, and he doesn't have a problem going home and spending a few hours for finding the right links and everything for tomorrow's class. He loves that. And I can see myself doing the same thing. I yeah. mean, you get stuck searching for certain things on the Internet, but it's so easy to just quickly compile it, where I think it would take longer to look it up in a book or find it online and then print it out and then go to school tomorrow and make copies and make sure you have enough copies, whereas you can just put it all there and say, look, there it is the next day. And I so. mean, once you, and if you do this, so say I'm a history teacher, the first two or three years I do this, I have two or three years built up of pretty yeah. much, that's my basic, you know, the basic stuff that I'm going to use. Obviously, every year I'm going to get new supplemental stuff to mm -hmm. add to it, but you have... The you bones. Know, yeah, exactly. You have the bones to what you need to do for your entire class compiled in one spot, easily accessible to both you and your students, and then it's just going out there and finding a couple, you know, the new current trends, current issues, or mm -hmm. civic stuff about the election, obviously stuff that's not going to be current in a couple of years, but, you know, the Civil War is always going to be the Civil War. 
to put a Civil War video yeah. up there if that's what you're going to use to teach. Like, he has the James down to the Civil War. Yep. That's going to be current forever. It's going to work forever, the way that they had it in history. And I know he said today, actually, he's going to spend a lot of time this summer working on it. So then it'll be even more ready to go next year, and he'll have to do even less work. But yeah, it's something you can build up over time. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, it'll something. get better. Yeah, and you just edit and revise and say and go back and say, you know what? It's unlimited. It's unlimited the amount of pages yeah. that you can add to mm -hmm. it, the kind of stuff that you can do with it. They give you so many options that it would be a shame not to use something like this in your class. Well, I you wrap in it cynical. Imagining that the new <laughs> technology will, have, will be will suffer from the same flaws as the old technology. That's where my head's going do at you, the moment. Do you yeah. remember? Well, maybe you all had wonderful <laughs> high school teachers, but I did not have wonderful high school teachers. I had high school teachers who hadn't updated what they were teaching and the materials they were using. They were yellow at the edges. <laughs> yeah. So I would well, imagine that the that slide that the projector. It's not oh. that yellow in the filing cabinet, but man, it's you know, it's forty years out of date. It's still what he's teaching. And 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 history does change. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Some more changes. Yeah. So depending yeah. on how people sure it's like people people absolutely interpretation absolutely research, research so, changes. So the good side of what of I, I too share Suzanne's cynicism, um, and, but the good side of what I, I'm hearing is that teachers, if they're good teachers, will be working on curriculum, uh, and, and it's so your job, job. Yeah. all yeah. the time, and that's mm -hmm. what we should be doing. Uh, it's mm -hmm. never static. Whether you're talking about the Civil War, ancient Greece, or or you know fusion, yeah. nuclear yeah. fusion, but. But I am worried that serious issues of access. Seri you know, yeah. all kids do not, particularly the lower SES you go, there are, I mean, you can't I think, assume that kids have access to this. I yeah. think it would obviously be dependent, using something like this in your classroom would be dependent on where you teach. Definitely. And I mean, even if you do teach in, in like a suburb where you would assume that everybody, you have to know that not everybody's going to have access. Mm -hmm. But I think that it would be more usable there because they have, you know, computer labs that are available during school, during, you know, study halls and, and stuff like that. If you're willing to do this, you have to take into consideration all of those. Like, like you do now. Yeah. And this history teacher only uses it with his AP classes who have the iPads. He can't use it with the academic kids because it would just be so much, let's go to the computer lab today, let's go, you know, well, it's just that, back though. and forth. Yeah. I'm an AP kid. I'm special. Yeah. I got the iPad. I got all this access. You academically wouldn't even go to how ridiculous that term is. I, don't I know. <laughs> but, but, you know, so the, the blackbirds have to use going to the computer lab or don't get this. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, does that make I've, me crazy. Yeah. I've actually... I thought that's exactly how the other classes would feel, but I've heard the opposite from the kids. They say, I want to take an AP class. And maybe that will make them do better in school and then next year have an AP class. They seem into it. Like, they, they never, I've never heard any kid go, oh, well, you have the iPad. I mean, that's how, probably how I would feel if it was me. But, and I understand if they did, but there's a lot of positive reaction from the kids who don't have it. Plays, it always plays two ways. I know. Yeah. I'm sure there are, but they don't say anything. In terms of editing and revising this, though, what I've seen teachers do is you constantly build it up over time. Mm -hmm. And then you always in every class have those students that are like the high flyers. And they're done everything in about two seconds. Your extra work or whatever you want to call it could be, and I've seen teachers do it for the whole entire class, put them in groups and say, okay, we've already gone through the Civil War to beat up on it a little bit more. <laughs> we've gone through the Civil War. What's missing? How could that page be improved? Yeah, that's a good idea. You go online, right. you find new resources, you at your group, really you go yeah. in and you edit and you revise the Civil War page. And you give them that option because when you go in to edit the the main part of your wiki that you, the teacher, control, you can lock certain pages so that the students can't edit mess that. Up. Can't mess yeah. up, can't go through because I was going through it today and I realized that I didn't have it locked and I was just messing around with it under the student account that I had created and I ended up deleting like an entire page and not realizing that I was doing it. So... You can, and if you want the students to do that, you just go, you unlock the one page that you want them to edit, and you say, don't delete anything, but just, you know, put on whatever new resources you find. Mm -hmm. and, and then like you can lock it back up immediately I after. I like that giving you power. Yeah. Exactly like so, so, so then, so then, the, since I was on a, mem a member of a school board for 10 years, you get the evil school board member, and they exist, mm -hmm. um, as well as the principal who says, 
yeah, this is great, but I don't like that picture that the slave you just had on, of all those yeah. things, take it off. Yeah. That's not, take off the reference to sex if you're talking about 20s and birth control and prohibition, mm -hmm. and talk about academic freedom right there, I'd be praised. Yeah. I mean, and, and so, how do you, you've got the world available. But couldn't and, that and happen? I want, I want students to find everything. Yeah. I don't want curricular lockdown on my yeah. teaching ability. So I'm worried about one more way that principals can say, school boards can say, are you kidding? You can't put that on. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It's just a thing to be worried about. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't that happen anyway? I mean, yeah, if you does. were in a classroom and you didn't have this website and you, you had a picture on the wall or a worksheet, couldn't they do the same thing? Is oh, it? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I've done it. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. Yeah. I'm just saying that there are a lot more places to go to get stuff, so the world is more yeah, open. Yeah, I see. And so, do you say something to your principal? Do you not? Do you do it anyway? Do you? Do? I think they're just issues to think about. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if I want students to be ultra critical in the critical literacy sense. I want them to be savvy and question yeah. everything. And that means going to places that not everybody's going to agree. Right. Oh, I know. You know this by now. <laughs> but or you also have to watch out. In every page, there is a discussion and a forum area. Yeah. So, I mean, you could have, if students were savvy enough, they develop their own affordances for different tools. Mm -hmm. They could go in and be trash talking to each other mm -hmm. within the discussion yeah. if they wanted to. Or now, you can set it up so that when you, if you have discussion board posts or forum, whatever, you can have it set up so that you're immediately not you're notified via whatever email you sign up with this when there's a change uh, or somebody posts something. And you can even, I think, set it up so that it won't post until you approve the post. So it would be sent to you, you know, in the morning you get to school, you're setting everything up, you look through your email, this post good, this post good, that post is definitely not good, don't allow that to be posted if it's an inappropriate comment because then that would be your ability to say, no, that's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another way to teach them, you know, appropriate use of, of the internet and computers. Yeah, yeah. agree. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's does this teach? No. It is complex. Yeah. Protect it. I, I just went on to try to log on and get my own wiki space, and there's three options. Public, free, where everyone can view and edit your pages. Protected is free. Everyone can view pages. Only wiki members can edit them. And then private, first 30, 30 days free. Mm -hmm. You can, um, if you use a .edu email. But on the bottom, teacher. it'll say, do you want an educational one? Yeah, I clicked on the educational one as a teacher. And, that's and the what private that, will still be free. Oh, okay. This one, I believe, the one that I did for my class, I set as protected. And then, because you can choose options within it, and I said only people who are members of this wiki can edit it, and I haven't accepted anybody. I've only accepted, you know, the one student on the show. But the other thing that you can see, and I don't know if you can see on this one, but I know on mine, is that you can actually view like how many people see your wikis and how often they're looking at them online. Oh, those stats. Yeah. So if you go to the, no, not that. If you go into your wiki and then you go to the, right here, it's behind that bar. Hold on. I think you can scroll down. There we go. Manage my wiki. This is where you can get all of your options. So you can add pages. This is where you can make stuff private. You're met, you can look at your members and the permissions you're allowing for certain people to have. But you can also look at the statistics of your wiki so you can see when people view it. Views, unique visitors, people that edit it. So mine was for a project, so it was all edited with like three days. Um, any messages and who, how many editors and all that stuff. So you can compile a bunch of information about, you know, this is a way to say, if, if you're using this as a trial tool, maybe your first or second year teaching, and it's just, it's not working, you can use this data to either back it up or say, you know what, this isn't going to work for this class. Let's try something else. It looks like a lot of fun. I mean, it, it, and you have a, like a learning curve for anybody, I think, would be steep, but <coughs> enticing. Yeah. You know, if you want to do it for that, there are all kinds of And once you get into it, it's... My argument in my class was that kids are going to want, most kids are going to want to, you know, be on the computers and have access and be able to do creative things. 
in class instead of maybe writing a paper. So maybe instead of writing a paper on a country, you have them do this project. You bring them to computer lab. You give them a little bit of freedom on the computers, and you allow them to really get into it. It's very creative. They can set it up exactly the way they want it and pick exactly the pictures they want, and, and it's theirs, and they're going to have that sense of ownership over the project, maybe a little bit more so than just a paper they have to you know write and hand in. Well, I'm glad you're going to instruction, because that, that was where I was headed next. In terms of how is this, and it's based on what you were just asking, Suzanne, um, instructional tools in and of themselves, as you know, are just tools. So how do we get around as teachers, and, and I think college professors are, are wrestling with this just as much as K-12 teachers, how that, wow, oh, this is a shiny, fun toy, and everybody's going to have fun with it, and I'm going to have fun with it, uh, but, but will it actually change my teaching? Not unless I, I figure out how to do that. Will it change student learning? Not unless I, I actually figure that out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a digital textbook. Yeah. And it's just the electronic version of the kid with the poster board saying, look at my pretty pictures. <laughs> yeah. of, uh, which I did. I actually did a report on Brazil in fourth grade. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that. And so I brought in cookies and did the poster. And so this is a great electronic version of it. But unless we get really good at instructional methods, of what are students learning? And how are we teaching? And how are we creating it's no different, ultimately. Yeah. So how do we how do we work with that? How do we think about that? I don't. Know. I agree. I think there. <laughs> you want there, to show them the, the wiki that Pat and I have? Yeah. And feel free to criticize us. Or <laughs> well, maybe not. That. I think the the <laughs> biggest. <laughs> no, <she's laughs> she's the only well, she's, criticism well, would be that people didn't out. get it. <laughs> the other thing that's that a, a huge question that each one of us needs to come to terms with is. Online, there is a reader-writer nature of information, okay? You can easily read and edit and then write and construct your own text. Each one of us needs to, if you go this route, how comfortable are you with one student editing, deleting, and revising the work of another? Doesn't matter how long time has passed, but the, the fundamental nature of a wiki is that you go in and it's nothing is permanent. Like the book so, list, uh, but like the book the book list that yeah, exactly. the order got screwed up and then, and then it frustrated down. me so, so much. So how do you deal with Timmy writes something down and then the next day or a year <laughs> later, Susie comes in oh, and no. says, "No, this is different now." Like with the like Wikipedia, they're writing that's a little You can protect. So let's say I'm in a group on Brazil and you're in a group on China. That's protecting it so that all of a sudden you don't decide, I'm just going to be a you can't even You can't even get into that Brazil group. Okay, way that I have set up. But, but, but if you have it totally set up, Brazil. so let's say we're both yeah. in a group, and my example earlier about the Civil War, and go back and, and edit and revise, just something as simple as I write in, you know, I add some dots, some facts about different wars, you know, in the Civil War, different battles, and then you go in later, and take some of my ideas and clarify some of my wording or add more facts and stuff like that. How fun is, there, is, is there no way to prevent that? You can prevent it. I mean, you can lock it down. In our class, in reading adolescent literature, we had an agreement. Pat and I discussed it, and then we talked about with mm -hmm. students. You were not to change anything else anybody put. Yeah, I would feel very strong yeah. about that. And that was our rules. You don't change and it anything. Is, and I can, I, the teacher, can yeah. cause that to be. And we said up here, in the discussions for each page, if you see something that's wrong, you put it in the discussion, you don't edit somebody but else's exactly. work. Okay. There's yeah. no electronic means to protect it, is there? Tell You're, me it's, it's, it's with etiquette. You can lock down pages. Oh, you can. Yeah, you can lock down pages. Okay. We had it as etiquette, because we wanted to, as you mentioned before, we wanted to build those skills, the knowledge, skills, mm -hmm. and dispositions in our students. Right. Do you want to show what we did? Which part? All whatever, of it? Whatever worked or didn't work for you. Sure. Well, I liked that, um, well, I still like that we have all of the access to all of this. Because actually, the other day, um, there was, the English teachers had a meeting with the their twin high school in Meriden. And uh, they were trying to come up with new books for the incoming freshmen next year. And they couldn't, they were talking about a topic, and I happened to be in the office. I said, oh, we just had that presentation about bullying. You should pick a book that reinforces all of that. And we couldn't think of anything, and I remembered in our class somebody had a... Uh, the internet going on? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> also another problem, <laughs> especially here. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, there's um, everybody made an annotated book list, and every, it had to have a theme. And I remembered that in class somebody had the theme of cyberbullying, or maybe it was just regular bullying, I don't know. But I went onto the wiki right there while we were t having the discussion, and I found it, and I emailed it to the teacher, and she brought it to the meeting, and I thought that was really cool. Yeah, you know, I was, like, really I, cool. I was like, I haven't really read the whole list, but I'll send it to you, you know. That's wonderful. And it, I mean, I think we're all under the impression from that class that everything that we have put on here is to share, to help each other. So, I mean, I didn't say, oh, this is my list. It had her name on it, and I let her use it. And, and there's it's another way that you can do it, too, is I have it on here for like professional development. Like, if you have the history department, you can have one of these for the history, history department. department. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a couple people that teach world history. You find a great resource, you post it right there. Immediately, they can get it in their class. Yeah, you and could just. That, that's it, very cool. Yeah, and it's pretty awesome the way that it's able to work with the internet. So even if you're in a school where there aren't enough computers for the kids, you could at least use it among your faculty mm -hmm. to share ideas, that's and cool. I think that would be equally as beneficial. Mm -hmm. Another way we talked about it mm -hmm. about it too is we have a lot of kids at my school that are homebounded. Uh, they can't come to school, so this would be a great way to be able to get them the information they need instead, you know, because I know they have tutors that collapse them, but, you know, maybe they have time during the day, and they want to work on something, and you're doing a project, and you can just, they can get right on their wiki and be like, okay, I can do this, this, and this before my tutor gets here, and it gives them a little bit of flexibility as well. Sorry, I don't know why. No, it's not your fault. What about, um, would it be me if I didn't say this, I haven't had either one of these in class, what, what are your certifications? History. history? Secondary oh, English. English. Yeah. Um, so what about gender issues with regard to use of computers? Um, there's lots of literature that talks about girls generally being afraid of technology and uh, deceiving to boys, letting them... You can see who's commenting, whether they're boys or girls, but you don't know who's actually... Even if my hands are on the keyboard, yeah. Ian could be saying, type this, type that, type that, That's and true. you know... Um, so, and there are lots of other issues that boys are just generally more comfortable with computers. Gaming, all kinds of gaming issues. Boys have a, you know, dominate that field yeah. hugely. Oh, so, um, not, the, uh, yeah, I know, my son's doing my hands. I'm not kidding. But, <laughs> but, there's lots of, so, and there, and there's exactly the point. They're very comfortable with it, and, and girls are like, oh, the technology, you know, you know. So, so I think it's a real issue, and another thing, in addition to access, how do we all be sensitive to that? And what do we do about it in our, our classrooms? Because I don't; those issues are not it's, done. It's hard. I know. You know it is. It's, that's a hard <laughs> question. But I think that hopefully, the more that they are able to access this stuff and, and have the ability to get on and do things, the more comfortable they'll become. Because if you can, if that's what you use, for example, you say that that's the excuse. I'm not going to do it because you know I have half girls and half boys, and I think that the girls are going to struggle. And I just want to make it as even as possible. But now you're taking away an opportunity for them to learn oh, how to do it. So, and I, I think, because we've had this discussion before about the cyberbullying, the Twitter and the Facebook and people having their online presence and what they can, what's, they already have posted on them by the time they get to high school. And I think that one of the ways that it can kind of be dealt with is by starting at a young age. I mean, I don't think technology is, is going to go away. I think it's here to stay. So if we can start them at a young age with their keyboarding classes, and I remember I had keyboarding in middle school, and, and um, internet, like how to use the internet, basic like search, like what is an appropriate uh, you know, source to use, and stuff like that, and just kind of build it up. Maybe by the time they get to high school, though, that gap will be gone. And I know that's not something that we can count on, but the more chances we give them to, to lessen that gap, I think that we have to give it to them. Well, I think that's the point you made earlier. It's our students are, and you made this point as well. Our students are technologically savvy. They have the toys. Okay, they're not informationally savvy at all. They're not digital natives. They don't come in like pre-qualified to use these tools. Um, <laughs> under that mindset, because you were born during the agricultural revolution, you'd be pre-qualified. No, you that tractor. Yeah, plow <laughs> field. So, um, so I mean, but. If you, as a teacher, can figure out ways to authentically, effectively include technology into instruction and provide those opportunities, 
then issues with gender, issues with bullying. Maybe you start slow. Maybe, yeah. you know, you in your department and you say, we want to get these kids, by the time they graduate, to be working on the wiki space. And you say, okay, freshman year, this is what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to search sources. We're going to learn how to type papers and annotate bibliographies and do all this stuff. And then the sophomore year, they're going to take it a little bit further and they're going to start, you know, doing a little bit of website stuff and, and showing videos in class, maybe multimedia presentation. You can kind of build them up too. I think it's another option. Yeah. And if you can decide, and if you have, you know, somebody in administration that supports you and you have, you know, a group in, in your department that say, this is, this is our goal by the time they're seniors, this is what they're going to do, then it's everybody's responsibility to build towards that. Mm -hmm. And I think the students will be able to. Be so I got a point in question for the two of you. And I'll cut the recording off at this point. If you want to <laughs> Nancy asked a question before, and it's hugely important, and I know that each one of you have had struggles in your buildings with administration. Let's say you're in a building where the administration is not supportive of this sort of work. It exists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you do? Is this something that you do under the radar with your students, and you protect yourself? I mean, we've talked before about acceptable use policies, not talking about that. Let's say you have a permission you know, form that parents sign off, you want to do it, you feel the value in it, all of our schools railroad you into Common Core, you need to attend to those, but in terms of authentic effective use of technology, your principal doesn't care, it's Common Core, nothing else. Do you do it, and it's under the radar, or do you say, I don't care, I'm not going to use this tool? What do you do? I don't know, I feel like under the radar would be dangerous, especially as a new teacher, because that's just another a reason for them to say well you're not you're obviously not listening to anything and not I don't know I haven't actually had that many problems with administration so I wouldn't know I how to go about dealing with it I don't think it's a dichotomy I, I, I think that the only way to win this battle is to say this is a tool it's worth the common core yeah. let okay. me show you how and you're gonna, you might, you might, it's if not, they say that, you might have to prove yourself. You, you might, might say, give me this yourself. class, you might give say, me this that, year, and I can show you that it will work. And they're going to you get to the confident. same high scores. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to the same aim. Yeah. Give, yeah. Me, give me the same end. You're not, because you're not. educated by the Jesuits, so I'm going to get to the same end. Give me freedom with the means. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're not spending the entire year teaching them how to build a wiki space. You're and using it as a tool to teach them your content and your and writing skills. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you can even use it in math and mm -hmm. to whatever you're gonna do. It's not that's not what you're teaching them. You're using it as a tool to teach yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. And using that Put that woman on tape. Yes. yes. See, because, because that's that's the way to win the battle, Lee. Once it becomes bells and whistles for their own sake, it's doomed. Well, and also, what you just demonstrated is the strength to know I am the teacher. I do know what I'm talking about. I, yeah, are we all going to make mistakes? Sure. But I was trained well. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> to, I was trained to know what I'm doing. And forget tenure, not tenure. If you start saying that when you're, when you're there, you'll never do anything great. And you really you can't. Are you listening to me? Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, are not, they're not unreasonable. They're, no, they are. They're scared, too. Yeah. And so, I think that would be a bigger issue, is the fact that they're taking away these opportunities for students to learn new and exciting mm -hmm. things. And, you know, maybe this kid isn't excited about history, but they love being on the computer, and they excel mm -hmm. in computer class. Exactly. We'll give them the option to excel in exactly. both computers and history. Find me the exactly. best five pictures of a civil war that depicts X, yeah. Y, or Z, yeah, exactly. and help us build this curriculum. Yeah. yeah, make a map and put it up there so that everybody can, you know, work on it. Or yeah, yeah. find two that. opposing ideas about X. And that's differentiation. Oh. Well, there it is. Right there. Yeah. Add on to the five so. pictures. Find five pictures. Tell me which one is the best of the five, and then and explain why. why you picked you got it. There you go. <laughs> and this, I think, this tool lends itself to differentiation. It. Is perfect because, like you said, you can say for kids that are struggling, you know, pick these images and this. And another kid, you can have you've got the kid that's excelling in the class, and you say, Go find me more resources and edit this page and put them on there. And you can have one class working on completely different things, but all towards the same end. Or, or the kid, or the kid who's struggling mentally and she or she needs some success, please find me. You know, same exact assignment, yeah. but the kid just needs to do that to get a win 
academically. Yeah. And the then, poker chips. You watched that video last night. Yeah. When the chips are down. Needs more chips. <laughs> and more chips. I think if this resource is out there for the students, and you're that student that's struggling in class, you have access. You can go review the materials mm -hmm. before class. Mm -hmm. You can post mm -hmm. links to quizzes. You can post all of this stuff, or just you can have a whole page on test review. Mm -hmm. Go on here, and then you know this is the test, and just that gives them another tool to use, and not just reading the book because we know how dull that gets, and your eyes glaze over, and you're not, you know. Mm -hmm. So this just gives them another option on, on how to study. Mm -hmm. I like it. I would definitely use this. The class. issue is though, see that that's the literacy. That's the way you're acting in it. Where does this literacy get taught? Where does the you mm -hmm. click here, you go here, you, this is what sure. this means, the icon this is the iconology. That's all reading. Now we're reading yeah. Yeah. Icon. it is. I think, I, it's, I think it's gonna have to be very early. Yes. Uh, because I think we really do our kids a disservice if we don't think that they don't know some of what we're talking about and then we gotta deal with it. I don't know what you've heard about autism and uh, exposure to screen. If there's some new populations in, I think Arizona and New Mexico, if they've never been introduced to a screen, a, a, um, so they only have seen three-dimensional objects. There are no, there's no incidence of autism. Now, I know that's a correlation causation Whoa. issue. Whoa! There's no <laughs> autism. No TV. No computer. And so. If we introduce it younger, maybe there are no shrinks today. No ah, that's true. Uh, no DSM in that corner of the world. Yeah, that's true too. It's, I mean, Never I know specifically to me, I can't read for a long periods of time. Like if a teacher posts an article on Blackboard and it's no, more than like ten pages, I'm printing it out. Me too. I'm not going to sit yeah. there and read it on that thing because there is a glare, and it is difficult to read. But I mean, I don't think that I would be giving the kids, you know, four hours of work in front of a computer screen every night. It would. Be, I would hope small amounts over a longer period of time so that you know you build it up and you're not just sitting there like hour three I'm still on this thing you no know? and then it's no different than book right exactly yeah it's, it becomes the same thing but I mean that's the challenge is over the next week you and I are developing okay this is what we want our students to do in middle school high school you know okay here we are I, I would say in elementary school, mm -hmm. and also more importantly, we know that you set your roadmap, your educational roadmap, you know, K through three. How do we start to build these skills in there so that the students can build up? Into and it's those amazing, places. like, what students can and can't do. Like you were saying before, you can't just assume everybody knows this stuff. I was in a class the other day, and I was um, in a resource room, and we were typing papers, and it was painful to watch this one kid type and this and that and this and I, I was like you know TJ have you ever had a computer class or or a keyboard class or anything no miss we, we never had that so I think it's, it's also you can't just assume when they get there there has to be some sort of you know longitudinal thing where they start with the basics and then build it up because if they don't have the basics and they get to you you can't expect them to say oh maybe I'll get the page there because that's clearly that's you're setting them up for failure, you're not setting them up for success. That child was probably pulled out of the computer elective to take remedial reading. Mm -hmm. So we have this huge issue yeah. of, mm -hmm. of not permitting the neediest of the children to have maybe the exactly the resources they need so it becomes the that's that's why Nancy jumped all over the AP I think mm -hmm. because because what we're concerned about is that it becomes a privilege for the elite and then that mm -hmm. gap is going to just yeah. oh, oh, exactly. get bigger and bigger exactly. so I think that if you're committed to something like this and you kind of have to do it across the board but you have to know your audience at the same time if you're in a school that is not going to be supported you're not going to get that computer a lot of time and you know you know 60 percent of these kids don't have Computers at home, then this probably isn't the tool for you. Well, then you run out of hands. That's it. And yeah. I've argued that the kids that need this sort of tool the most are the ones that don't get it because of things like That's the AP students get it and the others don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, the student that is really struggling and in the remedial classes and in the, the capped, you know, training class or whatever we're going to call it, they're the ones that need this the most. But instead, they're going to the prepackaged materials, you know, on how to pass the well, CMTs. I'm, I'm hopeful. That the new CMTs, the SCAC CMTs, mm -hmm. which are going to be computer delivered and computer mediated and involve critical analysis of video clips. 
I'm, I'm hopeful that for, the, for all of the wrong reasons, they will drive us to the right place. Mm. Because if we're doing test prep, then test prep means you've got to be computer literate. Okay. Then suddenly we'll find the resources. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. No, they just it. found a whole bunch of resources at our school for iPads. Like they dug them up underneath the floorboards. Yeah. 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 Right. Tell me it's going to erase test scores and suddenly yes. it's suddenly there's some motivation. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And you can also get really good, and I think we have to get even better, at asking for things for kids, just like you were saying, for the kids who have the least. Uh, the grocery store where I used to work that is one of the biggest employers in, the, in, the, in upstate New York. And I would tell my students there, go with your list, go with the curriculum and say, this is what I need. These kids don't have that. Bring the, the equivalent of the DRG scores. Ask. And it's amazing what employers and people want to do for kids because they benefit. Oh, aren't we wonderful? We help people. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and in a perfect world, we certainly wouldn't have to do that. But it isn't perfect. And, yeah. yeah, that's true. Interesting stuff, Gary. Thank you both. Thank you. So you thank you. Oh, it was yes. fascinating. It was a fascinating discussion. I, I get to be a student instead of a teacher. Mm -hmm. Thank you I both. I have a question. How does this compare to Moodle? Moodle. I don't know. Ian would probably know. I think, <laughs> well, with Moodle, like Blackboard, you'll be able to, you have wiki elements that are built into Moodle, or you can add into Moodle. Um, it's not as feature rich. The, Moodle, the, the wiki in Moodle or the wiki in Blackboard is nice, but it's not as slick as this. You have much much more functionality on here in WikiSpaces than you do um, in Moodle. Like, I no, love Moodle. We need, I we need so discussion, lot, so I'm glad you. <laughs> okay, can I ask you a question totally unrelated to this? But uh, we were at a faculty meeting today, and one of our teachers went off to do a, a NEAS thing at a different school, and then she was talking about the uh, uh, levels. And I, at our school in Meriden, they've gotten rid of them a lot, and it used to be, yeah, I guess so. It used to be like A, B, C, and you know, essentially the smartest kids. Right, smart class, not so smart class.